and uh, the date is in the bulletin. Please mark your calendars and plan on being here uh, for Sunday school at 9.30, followed by worship at 11, and, and we're not going to keep you for just that time uh, afterwards. We'll have a dinner, and then our, our tertiary congregational meetings. So that'll be a very full Sunday, the second Sunday, September the 13th, it looks like. Um, there's an announcement about the Deacons Fund again, if, if you are able to contribute, that would sure be appreciated. And I want you especially please to mark your calendars for the two events we have coming up. Brent Ron from Tioga, he uh, is going out on the mission field to India for, with our AFLC. Uh, he has graduated from our seminary and, and uh, has accepted a call to go and work with the people there. He'll be here at 7 o'clock on Wednesday, August 19th. That's not this coming Wednesday, but the following. So please mark your calendars come uh, as families and, and be informed about this mission work so that we can be in prayer for him and an opportunity to support that mission work. And then also, um, we want you to know that Joel Finiscard is going to be here with a trumpet concert on Sunday, September 6th. And uh, again, a time of refreshment. We look forward to uh, being refreshed with the hymns that he'll be playing and songs he'll be playing for us. Then there's one other announcement we have. You know, sometimes when I announce birthdays, it's older people and they don't really want to have it announced. But today I announce about a birthday. And she wants her birthday announced, I think. <laughs> Doesn't she, Elsie? She, she is in potty. Oh! <laughs> You have another announcement? Pardon? Another announcement? Oh. Mary gave me one and I put it in the bottom. Board of Christian Ed is going to meet next Sunday right after church. Okay? And uh, again, with Sunday school starting, uh, there are a lot of important things to get ready. So, Board of Christian Ed, those who are on that board, please remember uh, next Sunday right after church. Is Elsie back yet? No. Oh. <laughs> we'll hold off a little while. Let's read together our call to worship. <clears throat> Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is unseen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen Thank you, Heavenly Father, that through your word we see glimpses of, of that which is unseen, of the gift you have given us, of the promises that are connected with that gift. Call us, we pray, through your gospel today that we might live each and every day in repentance and faith, and that as we live in faith we might live with joy and peace, and Lord, that you might move our hearts to love, that we might love our neighbors not only with the gifts you've given us that are material, but that too, we might love our neighbor with the gift of the message of the gospel. So Lord, work in us that you might work through us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We will open with a hymn that's also a prayer, and I, I ask that you make this a prayer as well after we sing Happy Birthday. Uh, do you want us to sing Happy Birthday to you, Elsie? <laughs> Jesus for today. And we'll end with may Jesus bless you, okay? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Elsie. May Jesus bless you. So good to have you with us today, sweetheart. Okay. Now we'll sing our opening hymn, which is also a prayer, and I ask you to come, come thou fount of every blessing.
our sins. Dear Heavenly Father, we bow for you to confess that we have sinned against you in our words, actions, and our thoughts. We come to ask your forgiveness and to seek your great mercy. We come to you in the merits of Jesus Christ, not our own, but not on our sins or our iniquity. Wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ so that we may be clean before you. This we pray in Jesus' name. our eyes on Jesus, that we would 
be willing to accept your answer, whether it be deliverance from whatever we're suffering, or whether it be the strength we need to go through it. In all things, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would make our need for depending on you more and more clear, and that you would make your faithfulness to us more and more clear each and every day. Heavenly Father, we ask that your grace, your mercy, would shine through us, that as we acknowledge you as God in how we live, whether we go through times of ease or times of difficulty, you give us the opportunity to answer those who are watching us, to give a reason for the hope that we have. And Lord, work in us that we would be ready to point people to Jesus. Thank you that you've enabled us to send out missionaries and teachers in our Bible school and seminary. Lord, as they carry your word to many, many people, we pray that you would bless that word, that you'd be preparing those who will hear even now, that as the seed of your word lands, it would find good soil and grow and bear fruit that brings glory to you, that people would become connected to the true vine. And, and Lord, in that connection, that true fruit would be born. Lord, pray that you'd be with our missionaries throughout the world. We pray for our nation as well. Heavenly Father, as we have seen this nation departing from you, calling good evil and evil good, and as we see an election season begun again, we pray that you would bless us. We know we don't deserve your blessing, but we ask, Heavenly Father, that in our nation you'd be at work in churches even today, that people who don't know you would be called to repent some faith, that people who have had no regard for you might have regard for you, that people who have not trusted your word might come to trust your word from beginning to end. We pray for leaders, Heavenly Father, that would seek out your will and your interests rather than to seek to uh, use their power to manipulate others. We pray, Heavenly Father, that You'd be at work in the lives of the leaders we have now. Bring them to repentance and faith that they might not just serve their own interests, but might serve the interests of the people of this nation, and that they might serve the interests of your righteousness. Lord, we pray that if there be those who would refuse to do so, that as elections come up, you would remove them from office and give us leaders that acknowledge right and wrong, that acknowledge truth and falsehood. Be with us, Lord. We pray for revival and that it would begin with us. We know that if it is to begin with us, it means sacrifice on our part. We know that it means difficulties. I pray that you'd empower us and give us wisdom, that we would not be afraid to stand up for what's right, that we would not be afraid to speak the truth and love. Lord, keep us from wanting to speak the truth just to prove we're right. Help us to speak the truth in order that others too may come to know Jesus. Do a work, we pray, in our nation. Begin with us. Begin with each of us here, Lord. We come to you right now. Pray that as we put ourselves on the potter's wheel, you mold us and make us into all that you want us to be. Thank you that your will for us is good. In Jesus' name. Amen. Today our Old Testament lesson is one that has perplexed me for a long time. It's about uh, the guy my first grandson was named after, Elijah. And it, it, it's, Elijah lived in a time that was very difficult in the northern kingdom. Israel and Judah were divided at the time. He lived in the kingdom that had, was sold out to idolatry. And, and yet God called him, and then after him, Elisha did amazing miracles through them. And yet, as we read this text today, I'm encouraged as I read it to find that Elijah was just a man. James tells us that. But uh, sometimes we like to put him on a pedestal and think, oh, he was something special. God can't use me like he was Elijah. Not true. Today we read about Elijah after he had appeared on Mount Carmel and God had set fire down from heaven to consume the sacrifice he brought after he put all of the prophets of Baal to death, and now we see it as he's threatened by Jezebel, what he does. And uh, I think this will remind you of yourself. I know it reminds me of me. And yet God can 
continue to work through him. What a wonderful God we have. First Kings chapter 19, the first eight verses. If you're able, please let's stand together in respect for God's word. Now Ahab would witness what happened on Mount Carmel, told, told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets, the prophets of Baal, with the sword. So Jezebel sent a message to Elijah and said, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life of one of them. And Elijah was afraid, and he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, and he sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree, and he fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread, baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and he drank, and then he lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So Elijah got up and he ate and he drank, and strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Here ends the reading of our scripture. <clears throat>
cleaning and making our prayer pass be not, O gentle Savior. Jesus said to them, 
that they were seeking the wrong kind of bread, and he said, I am the bread of life. That, that was the last verse we had last week, verse 35. And we see him repeating that now twice in this text that we're going to continue with. We're going to begin back in, in verse 35, the last verse from last week, and continue this week and then next week as well. We're going to read through verse 51 this week. And from this, I mean, we all recognize that we, like these people, are people as well. And how we can't trust many others, but also the one we don't want to trust is ourselves. May this call us to even question ourselves and instead trust Jesus. In John 6, 35 through 51, if you're able again, please and respect for God's word, let's stay on this reading. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never grow hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I have told you, you have, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. At this the Jews began to grumble about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting or eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate manna in the desert, yet they died. But there is the bread that comes down from heaven which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Lord, I pray that you work in our hearts and lives that we would not question this claim, but based on the evidence and the call that you give us, that we would all be those who leave trusting in Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life, the way to the Father, as the one who truly will raise up even our bodies that will lie in a grave one day, raise them up to be with you forever. Grant us the gift of faith and the desire to share the truth with others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. It's quite a claim Jesus makes. I am the bread of life. People are kind of perplexed by that claim as they hear him make it, as they hear him make it but they're even more perplexed by the claim he makes that he came down from heaven. That's what bothered them the most. We see as Jesus claims to have come down from heaven, he's saying it now in Galilee. If you read John chapter 5, he sees in Jerusalem. He does a miracle there too. He heals a man that has been a paralytic for many, many years. And as he shares who he is in Jerusalem, he's rejected by the leaders of the church, by, by the Pharisees, by the priests, by the teachers of the law, by the St. Ingram. All of them reject him. Now he's up in Galilee, his home territory. Should he receive him? There, should he not? And yet, now these people from up north, from Galilee, when he makes this claim to have come down from heaven, what do they do? They say, hey, we watched you grow up. Would he know your mom and dad? His dad had passed away, but they knew him. 
His mom was still among them. His brothers and sisters were there. They, they're wondering, how can this guy that we watched grow up in our midst claim to have come down from heaven? And they grumble against Jesus. We need to see that Jesus talks about the Father drawing people. And as we read this, we need to be very, very careful that we don't do what some do and say that the Father draws some to Christ and leaves others alone. It's not true at all. We read in God's Word again and again that God is willing that none would perish. And we see from this text a large multitude of people. Next week we'll find that almost all of them rejected Jesus, turned their backs, and walked away. And yet, we see Jesus drawing them to himself. This whole conversation is not Jesus having an argument with anyone. You see, he answers very few of their questions. Instead, he gives them what they need to hear. He proclaims the truth to them because it's the Father's will that he draw them. God draws us today through the gospel by proclaiming the truth. And the gospel is this, that God sent his Son. His eternal Son, the eternal Son of God, was sent in order that all that is necessary for us to have eternal life might be given to us as a gift. And we'll be looking at that in more detail as, as we look at this text more completely. But... The Father's will is that as Jesus is sent and reveals his heart and calls those who, who he spoke to and continues to call through his word today, that he speaks to today as well. His desire is that all men would come to him, that all would be drawn. And so Jesus is talking to these hard-hearted people, these people that have witnessed this great miracle that should have told them something, but they didn't get the message. Instead, they were still filled with their human appetites their own natures are what they followed rather than allowing what was evident because Jesus made a claim to be bred from heaven. It was evidently true because of the miracle he performed before them. When he says to them, you've seen me and yet you do not believe, what is he saying? Just that they've seen him like I see you and you see me? No, he means you've seen me. You see not just me physically. But I've shown myself to you. I've shown you who I am by my deeds. The miracles I've performed, the fact that I've fed you all with such little food should say something to you. It should tell you that you need to listen to what I say. And maybe it's difficult to grasp to begin with, but you need to listen, hear it, and obey, because through all these things, the Father is calling you. The call of God is here today for you and for me. He's calling us to come, to come to Him. There's not a single person here that the Father would not want to draw to himself, and yet his call and his drawing are not irresistible. We see that Jesus even points to the Old Testament when he says in verse 45, it is written in the prophets, they will be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. All that God had been doing throughout history and was doing now through His Son, Jesus Christ, was meant to call people to come to Him and receive what He would give. So Jesus says, I and the Father are not working separately. I and the Father are working together. I came to do His will. He draws men to Himself. He is drawing right now through me, and He will later on draw people through the Holy Spirit and through His Word, but not irresistibly. We can harden our hearts. We can hear the good news of the gospel. We can look at the evidence there is that Jesus' claims are true. And we can say, I refuse to believe. Sadly, that's what most people do. Most people, like those who were in the audience that day, harden their hearts when Jesus makes a claim that he came down from heaven. Sadly, that's what most people do. And yet Jesus continues to call them, continues to speak words to draw them. We see how tender and loving and caring our shepherd is who longs for us to come in to the flock. We see how loving our Father is who sent Jesus, who sent his Holy Spirit to call us today. We see it so clearly in this text as we see Jesus meeting this firm resistance and yet with patience 
even as in the Old Testament we see decades and centuries of patience on the part of God the Father, we see it now in Jesus, patiently calling these people to hear his claims, to consider them, to know that they can rely on his claims because they've witnessed who he is by what he's done. We see the Father drawing them then. He is through this message, through this passage of Scripture, drawing us today. He's calling us to come to Jesus, to come and recognize his claim and to do what? To eat the bread of life from heaven. And that is a stumbling block. What does it mean to eat this bread of life, to eat the flesh of Jesus as Jesus calls us to do? It gets even more clearer next week in, in the text that he calls us to do this. What is the meaning of this eating, eating the flesh of the Son of God? Jesus says, if anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And what does he claim this bread is? This bread is my flesh. If anyone eats this bread, which is my flesh, he will live forever. But you know, we have to see that Jesus is giving an analogy in this text that's as clear as can be. As he's speaking to this crowd, he hasn't spoken just about eating, but he's spoken about what it means. When we eat bread, we do it believing too. When we're hungry and famished, we believe that that bread will fill our appetite, don't we? And as we grow up and come to understand what eating is all about, we come to believe that not just bread, but all that God has given us to eat will nourish our bodies and, and keep us healthy and strong. We, we believe that. And so we, we eat it, we appropriate it. That's really the meaning of this word eating. Eating Jesus' flesh does not mean we become cannibals. Notice how many times Jesus says that it's he who believes that will be fed for good. He who believes will never be thirsty again because they're given what they need to drink to satisfy it. Their appetite, their appetite for what? To be reconciled to God, to have their sins forgiven? Their appetite to know that they can stand before the judgment seat of the one who created them and, and know that they'll be declared righteous? What is the meaning of eating? Well, look at verse 35. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. There's the definition of eating. We look further at verse 40. Whoever looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. We, we look further. We look at verse 47. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. Obviously, this eating is the same thing as believing. Believing does not just simply mean that I have an intellectual assent to who Jesus is. When we believe that bread will take care of our appetites and our nutritional needs, and bread meaning everything we eat, in this case, to take care of our nutritional needs, we don't just sit there and look at it and believe that it will do it. We appropriate it. And in this case, the word believe means the same thing. It means appropriate. It means to believe that Jesus is my life and to rely then on him, to trust in him, to no longer trust anything else. To, to throw all the other claims of everyone and everything else that say, I will satisfy your need, your spiritual need. I will satisfy your need of forgiveness of sins. I will satisfy all the hungers that you have spiritually. To reject all those claims and say, no, this is the bread I will appropriate. This is the one I will trust. I will not even trust me to take care of my spiritual needs. I will no longer trust the good works I do. They will not be my bread. There is one bread. It's Jesus. And I will appropriate him. Every time I sin, I will come to him. I will confess my sins and rest in the fact that what he has done is enough. That's the meaning of eating. It means to believe on Jesus in this text. In everything that Jesus said, that is clear. If you want to miss it, if you harden your hearts, you will miss it. If you harden your hearts, you'll think that what he's saying is a bunch of nonsense. But if you open your heart and listen to what he has to say, you'll see that eating that bread, the bread which is his flesh, is a 
appropriating him, appropriating the gift that he came to bring, the gift that is himself, the gift that is the one sent from the Father, sent from heaven, in order that we might be reconciled to God. Finally, we look at the end of this text and we see in, in verse 51, he says something a little different. Before he says, I am the bread of life. Now he says, I am the living bread. He contrasts himself with the bread that Moses gave. The bread Moses gave sure was a gift from God from heaven. It was given in a way that no bread I've ever eaten has been given. It was an amazing bread, but it was like earthly bread in the sense that all it did is it took care of the bodily needs as long as a person lived on this earth. Jesus said they all died. It didn't feed them so that they had eternal life. It just kept them alive while they were going through the wilderness. It was a bread for time, not a bread for eternity. He said that bread wasn't the living bread. I am living bread. Truly, he was living bread, living more than just as a man, living as God come down from heaven in flesh. The Bible teaches us again and again and again that Jesus made the claim to be not only man but God. Some say that it was his disciples afterward that decided to say that he was God. Then why did the people in this case turn against him and the people in Jerusalem turn against him? They understood Jesus. Why did he hang on a cross? Because they understood that Jesus made the claim to have come down from heaven. That he is the eternal God, but... He came down from heaven and took on human flesh. He became a man and yet remained God. He says, this bread is my flesh, verse 51. This bread that I'm offering is my flesh. You see, there is no salvation if God did not become flesh. There's no way any man with a sinful nature can work their way to heaven. We are born with a nature that is in rebellion against God, and when we live out our will in our lives, our will is always opposed to God. One of the books we read in seminary, quoted before, but it's worth quoting again, Lutherans and Conversion. Pastor in Minneapolis asked one of the men in his congregation, uh, did you play any part in your conversion? And the guy said, or in your salvation, the guy said, yes, I did. And the pastor said, really, what part did you play? And he said, I did all the resisting, and God did all the rest. What do we say to the I, I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. And Jesus says, no one can come to the Father unless he calls them. Well, through this gospel, he's calling each of us today. And today, if we respond, it's because of his call, not because of something in us. It's the gospel that's God's power of the salvation to all who believe. But this is the gospel. That the eternal God who dwelt in heaven forever was willing to take on human flesh. That he was willing to become not just the Lord of all mankind. He already was that. But the servant of all mankind. He took on human flesh with the great Philippians and became a servant. And was willing to serve to the point of death, even death on a cross. Not just a death from cancer or something like that. A death that lined him up, that made him look like a criminal. Like the worst of criminals. The death that the worst of criminals died under the Roman Empire. He was willing to lower himself to the lowest of the low in order to serve us. He couldn't do that just as God. He had to take on human flesh. There's no salvation unless the Son of God took on human flesh. He did yeah. This bread, this bread that he offers us to eat, in other words, what he offers us to believe in, to trust in, in order that we might be saved, is the fact that he came down from heaven and took on flesh. But we need to read more about that flesh in verse 51. This bread is my flesh, which what? Which I give for the life of the world. He's speaking in the future tense. We know what he gave his life. And, and we know why he gave his life. He gave his life on the cross. He gave his life in order that the wrath of God that you deserve, in order that the wrath of God that I deserve might be poured out on him instead. 
He was willing to receive in himself everything we deserve because of our sin. So that when we have the judgment to look forward to, we can know that our judgment is already complete. And that sin in me and death in me is a defeated enemy. Because death did not hold Jesus. He rose from the dead. Not just spiritually, not just the soul, not just the ghost out of the dead that appeared before the disciples. His body was no longer in the tomb. He defeated sin and its consequences in body, soul, and spirit. A complete victory. This bread is my flesh which I give. I will give for the life of the world. The life of the world. Who does that include? There's nobody not included. That is the gospel. There's not a single person sitting here for whom Christ did not give his flesh. And throughout this text he calls us again and again and again to believe that he is the one who came down from heaven and took that flesh in order that he might provide for us the bread we need unto eternal life. I am the bread of life. I am the living bread. We look and see how many times he connects this bread with its ultimate result. And also with the result that we experience here now by faith, but later will experience by sight. Look at um, Verse 39, where he says at the very end, but will raise them up at the last day. Look at verse 40. Whoever believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Look at verse 44. I will raise him up at the last day. Look at verse 44. Seven, he who believes has everlasting life, eternal life. Notice verse 50. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven which a man may eat and not die. Look at verse 51. Anyone who eats this bread, he will live forever. It's evident that eating this bread gives us eternal life now. It's a gift that God wants us to have now. Believing in Jesus gives us eternal life now. We don't experience that life in its fullness. We end up continuing to fight a battle. We, like these people, have hearts that are prone to wander, prone to not believe these claims of Jesus Christ. This text is giving, given to us, I believe, that we might distrust ourselves and realize how prone to wander I am and not trust me and instead say, oh Jesus, save me in every regard. Not only do I believe that you gave your life on the cross, but you're the one who needs to keep me in the faith. You need to be a work in my life that I can live each and every day in repentance and faith. The good work you began in me, it depends on you. And Lord, I turn to you that I might see your faithfulness in my life to keep me from wandering. That you might help my unbelief. Jesus' claim is, I am the bread of life, the bread that came down from heaven. Today, the question that is placed before us, do I believe him? Or don't I? Do I eat that bread? Or do I turn away and look for something else to fill my life? Jesus is the bread of life. And as that claim is made, and as it's upheld by his miracles, and especially by his resurrection, all of us have heard the news, all of us have heard the gospel. God is drawing us. And that drawing again is not irresistible. Today, we can harden our hearts. But as the writer of Hebrews says, and as he quotes from the Psalms, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Don't do it. To reject Jesus is to reject life eternal. It's to reject forgiveness of sins. It's to reject knowing what it is to be reconciled to God. Now it's to reject any hope of life eternal in heaven. A day will come when Jesus will return. And he speaks of this, that he will call those bodies that are in the grave to come out, and they will come out. And they will be made perfect like his resurrected body. They will live with him forever, but it's only, only those who are trusting in the bread of life from heaven.
trusting in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for making this message clear through your Son. And Lord, not just making the message clear, but making it clear that he pled with people that were hardening their hearts. Maybe that's somebody here today. Thank you for making it clear that you are so patient, but you continue to call even when people heart their hearts. That is your heart's desire that all men would come to repentance, that all men would come to the knowledge of the truth. Call us today, Lord. Call us that we might know Jesus is our Savior, Lord. Call us that we might be trusting in Him and in nothing else. Call us that we might be turning away from everything else and everyone else who calls us to trust. We might put our trust in Jesus alone. Do your work in us, Lord. And then work through us to call others. Hear us now, Lord, as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We'll stand as we close with God as God calling yet, shall we not hear?
I hope and pray that last verse was your testimony today. God has reached your heart. Here he is. I want to thank Vernon for playing again today. It just seems so great to see you up here again. Appreciate it a lot. And I want us all now, please open our hearts to receive the Lord's benediction. May the God of peace sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen. Amen.